welcome. So I think I'd just like to welcome Mr. Eni to share with us, to tell us more about himself. He will be part of us, he will be there to help us with discipleship, with mentorship. We will have mentorship forums for ladies, for men, and we, we, we have a lot in store for us as we continue to grow in zeal with knowledge. Let's appreciate him as we invite him to speak to us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chief, for the invitation to come and be here. Uh, it, is, it is a privilege and an honor for me to join you uh, in this <coughs> retreat. And uh, to be able to share with you a few things. <coughs> that uh, will help us as we continue to grow as young people, but also as believers. I can see some people that I know. Uh, the lady in green, I've seen her in the worship team at AIU. Is that so? And, uh, and Emmanuel. Emmanuel is my student. <laughs> <laughs> I am usually teaching him. So, uh, after I've gone, everything he tells you which is bad, cancel it. Everything <laughs> <laughs> he tells you which is good, accept it. <laughs> yeah, but it's a, it's a good man. I thank God for the opportunity. Um, just a little bit more about myself. As Tim said, I am married. This year, we are celebrating 15 years wow. in marriage. My wife. We got married in 2002, December 14th. The Lord has been faithful. I, I was serving in the Christian Union. How many people have uh, been part of the CEU at some point? Ah, I can see, I can see. So I was serving the Lord in the sea. I just focusing on the Lord vertically. I was not looking at horizontal, <laughs> any horizontal dimensions. I was focusing on the Lord and I was zealous mm -hmm. in the Lord's service. And as I was in the Lord's business, he also took care of my business. <laughs> and, uh, so my wife, we were in the sea together. And, uh, one thing led to another. <laughs> now we are partners for life. So it's a great thing to, to serve the Lord and to fellowship with his people when you are young. Amen? Amen. Yeah, so I work at AIU, I teach development studies. And... Uh, I worked with Focus for nine years before I went into teaching. I used to teach at St. Paul's, and then this year I've come to AIU. But I'm glad to be among you and to fellowship with you and to share with you. When Tim was talking about what they used to do when they were young and in, coming from our age, Pakaisi had come, which reminded me also of my days when I was in. I, I just left high school and uh, we went for a, uh, <clears throat> um, a camp also. When I came from the camp, I was so fired. I met a young man on the road as I was coming back. I asked him, are you saved? <laughs> he said, no. I said, we are on the road, the main road. I tell him, this is your day of salvation. Kneel <laughs> down here, right on the side of the road. Repeat this word after me. When I yes. <laughs> that guy got saved by force. That is the zeal. The same day I went and uh, I went after I went and we were grazing. Another guy came. Are you saved? Is the first question. <laughs> right in the middle of the plantation of the cow. <laughs> Repeat this one after me. And uh, that is it. That is it. I thank God for this man. And uh, nowadays I don't do like that. <laughs> nowadays. I first of all try to preach to you, and, and, uh, yeah, but, but I thank God. So I was asked to come and talk about zeal with knowledge, which is the theme of this retreat. And I will just explore a few areas with us as a way of just helping us to be able to grow in our understanding of God and um, of how he wants to use us. We are going to read two passages of scriptures, and I'm going to be asking you to be reading the scriptures for me as a way of doing, I teach something called participatory approach to development. Uh, so I want us to have a participatory approach. So let's turn to 
Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Fortunately, we have a projector here, so we can be projecting. And then Proverbs chapter 19, verse 2. We're going to read those two passages. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 12, verse 11. The Bible says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual father serving the Lord. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual father serving the Lord. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 2. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 2. The Bible says, <clears throat> It is not good to have zeal without knowledge, nor to be hasty <clears throat> and miss the way. So we are being told to not be lacking in zeal on one hand. On the other hand, we are told we are not, it's not good to have zeal without mm -hmm. knowledge. And so my sharing is going to be on those two, anchored on those two passages about having zeal and zeal with mm -hmm. knowledge. By way of introduction, let me say that one of the good things of being young is the energy that you have. The, the, they call it the gusto. Is it gusto or gusto? The gusto, the, the oomph, mm. eh? <laughs> and the passion that the young people bring. Among, anyway, when, if you're around the young people, you can't be bored. I love the energy of the young people. How they dance during present worship. <laughs> you know, in there you, you used to have very old people, mm. and now we have many young people. Mm. So when they are leading present worship, the VC is there, the DVC, the chaplain. We are told, Chese is, Chese is, Tere Muka, Tere Muka. <laughs> but the young people, the old people in the VC, they are just looking at their <laughs> <laughs> And then the young people are dancing, they are dancing, you know, they do <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> the zeal that they dance with. <laughs> I like the, 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 the zeal of the young people in the prayer meeting. <laughs> Have you been to a zeal prayer meeting? <laughs> hey. I go to a zeal prayer meeting and brethren are serious <laughs> with prayer. <laughs> you know, when you are the only people when they go to pray, they pray like this. <laughs> or they just sit down. Go to a see you prayer meeting. You, you will see the Z. Brethren are doing what they call kilometric prayers. <laughs> now, what amazes me is that I've never seen an accident in the, in the prayer meeting. <laughs> People are tracking all vectors and animals and people are back. You see something is coming fast and it's speed. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? the, the zeal. You see a brother in a corner. You think that he has gone and gone away. <laughs> Have you seen? Yeah. Is that right? That. When you grow older, you lose some of that fire. <laughs> and maybe you grow to be a little bit more mature or your energy levels go down. <laughs> but um, whether we are young or old, God's desire for us is that we may serve him and love him with passion, mm -hmm. with zeal. He calls us to love him and serve him with zeal. And that's what we want to look at today. But what is zeal? What is zeal? The dictionary defines the word zeal as great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. Great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. It is an enthusiastic devotion to a cause, ideal, or a goal. And so, a zealous person from this dictionary definition is someone who is enthusiastic about something or about someone. You can feel the enthusiasm around them. They, they are people who have passion. Passion for something, passion for someone, passion for an objective that they have. They are also people who are eager. 
eager to be involved, eager to do something. There is vigor also around them. They are vigorous. If they are dancing, vigorously preaching, vigorously. They, they are people who are vigorous and, and people who bring intensity to the things that they are doing. And so, when we talk about zeal, we talk about passion and being eager to do the things that God has called us to do. And as young people, we, this is our season to serve God with the zeal and the energy that he has given us. You will not always be like this. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And time is going to come as you grow in life that your energy level will go down. Some of the brothers here will develop what we call a public opinion. <laughs> they will become archbishops. A, a, a bishop with an arc. <laughs> uh, some of the ladies, after giving birth to three, four, five kids, they will not be as strong as they look now. This is your season. This is your time. Amen? Amen. When the energy levels are still high. So, the Bible has much to say about zeal. We saw in Romans chapter 12, verse 11, we are encouraged to be never lacking in zeal as we serve the Lord. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, Titus chapter 2, verse 14, the Bible says, we are getting it projected. Yes, begin from verse 13. Okay, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. good. Now, if you read it in the King, in King James Version, it says, a people for himself, zealous of good works. Can you see it there, KJV? Mm -hmm. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Mm -hmm. So you can see that one of the reasons that God has redeemed us and purified us is to serve him. And as we serve him, he expects of us to serve him with zeal. People who are eager to do good works. You remember in John chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, Jesus himself was consumed with zeal. John chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. You remember the place where some people were selling uh, things in the, in, the temp, in, the, in the temple? And he said unto them, that sold dogs to dogs, take these things hence, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And he said to, and his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. If you look at that story, Jesus did not go to those people and say, Brethren, do you feel like removing your dance <laughs> uh, out of this place? <laughs> Do you sense that it would be a good idea <laughs> not to be selling in the temple? <laughs> no. Z. He took Nyaunyu. <laughs> and he worked on those people's ears. <laughs> and then he... I want to beseech you with the mercy of God. <laughs> that if you are willing, please, kindly, without me doing anything bad, try to make the doves go away. No. <laughs> Z, he said, this is not right. How dare you make my father's house, a house of prayer, to be a place of merchandise, a market. That is zeal that was in him. So let us say from the beginning that God deserves to be loved and served with zeal. One has been served. God deserves to be loved and served with zeal. Not in a half-hearted, nominal, superficial way. Because God gave us his best, his only life. Mm -hmm. And Christ gave us his all, his life. So that we can serve him and also give him our best. Mm -hmm. 
We can serve him with devotion, we can serve him with dedication, we can serve him with commitment. Wholehearted devotion to Christ. If you look at what God has done for you, in saving you, in taking care of you from primary school and secondary, most of you are in secondary summer, high school and university and working, if you are to look at the goodness of the Lord in your life and ask yourself, what for all you have done for me, what can I do? You discover that God deserves your best. He deserves your all. Amen? Amen. Now, me, I am always challenged by the zeal of the Muslims towards their religion. Though they, it is based on wrong theology, their dedication and devotion to me is amazing. Have you seen the Muslim during Ramadan? They are, in the, they are in the mosque early in the morning, lunch time, evening, and for 30 days they don't eat the whole day. And you can see them from cabinet to secretaries to anybody else, they are so committed and devoted to their religion. How about us? How is our commitment? How is our zeal? We are the ones who serve the true and the living God. Mm -hmm. Then they are committed to false God. How about us who are committed to the true God? Are we committed to God's work? Are we committed to God's work? How are we serving? Are we serving with passion? Is there eagerness? Or are we dragging our feet when God calls us to serve him and to live for him? One has first Amen. You know, there's a way you can serve God until you believe that you are doing God a favor. <laughs> I say, God, surely, if I was not there, <laughs> how would you help yourself? <laughs> yeah? So, maybe you are in the present worship. And, uh, you know, you feel like you are the best thing that happened to God's people since the foundation of the world. <laughs> so you are being told, tomorrow we are coming for, 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 for practice. You know, present most people, they come for practice. They say, I me, mean, I don't need practice. I mean, I am anointed. I mean, I just need to show up there and the anointing falls on me. <laughs> or you are a keyboard player. Mm -hmm. And you know what, Kwasana? Mm. Especially in the present worship team, it is not possible. It's not. It is not. It will not be long before people in the present worship team are the choir because mm. I, for, I don't know for the reason why. Put on the person with a keyboard. So the following day, he said, "I'm not going to play." So you come and sit at the back. Another guy who was just learning begins to play the keyboard, <laughs> and now people are wondering what is happening today, because the guy before he gets the song, one song is over. <laughs> 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 that time you are sitting at the bar and something is telling in your heart, eh? So also, they, they think they, now they can see now they can see. Watch and let them feel it now. You mm. see? They think I am who? Now they can feel. Mm. <laughs> it's not about showing people. Mm. Up to this day, it was very nice. So it's not a, it, when we serve God, it's not about serving with dragging your feet or thinking about doing God a favor. If you remember where God has taken you from, the response that we have is to give the Lord our best. So I want to say this, that it is important for us to serve God with dedication, with commitment, and with zeal. Zeal is important, and we should not, you know, feel that... Uh, Although we are going to about zeal knowledge, I want to emphasize that it is important to give God our best and to serve Him with passion. Amen? Amen. But the Bible is equally clear that zeal alone is not enough. The Bible says, zeal without knowledge is not good. It's like this verse in Genesis uh, that says it is not good for a man to be alone. I know you know that verse. Mm -hmm. Especially the brothers. Mm -hmm. They keep claiming that verse. Say, Lord, you know, your word says, yes. it is not good for a man to be alone. Mm -hmm. So, we want to move from... Thank you. This is called Pastor Ferdinand Pong. Anybody knows him? He's a pastor here, sit and go. 
and we work with him in focus. Karibu sana. Welcome. So, it's good to have zeal. It is important to be zealous for the Lord. But the Bible says, zeal in itself is not enough. You need to have zeal with knowledge. So the question I want to address this morning is, why is it important to have zeal with knowledge? Why is it important to have zeal with knowledge? Three things that I'd like to share with you. Number one, because knowledge helps to direct our zeal to the right course, to the right purpose. Knowledge, knowledge helps to direct our zeal to the right course or purposes. Not all zeal is good. Some people have misguided zeal. They are zealous for the wrong reasons. Let me give you two biblical examples. The first example about people who are zeal without knowledge are the Israelites. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 1 to 3, Romans chapter 10, verse 1 to 3. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So the Jews were zealous people. They were zealous to be accepted by God. They were zealous to, to serve God and to know God. But Paul, looking at their zeal, says, their zeal was not according to knowledge. Why? Because they sought righteousness by works. By obeying the law, for example. Like the Bible, the law would say, observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. Those people used to keep the Sabbath mm -hmm. so zealously until there was no cooking on Saturday. If a donkey falls, they, they wait for the donkey until on Sunday. That's how zealous they, there was no fire. There was no the land just became because this is a holy day. That is the zeal which they used to look for righteousness. Fasting and tithing. They were they were zealous. For this thing. They believe that if they fast often and tithe meticulously, they would attain righteousness. Luke chapter 18, verse 12. Remember this story of the, 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 the publican, the Pharisee, and the, and the sinner, or the publican, who went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee, Luke chapter 18, verse 12, look at what he says. Go back a bit. Uh, so they went to the, pray, to the prayer. The, the prayer to the temple, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not as other men, extortioners and just adulterers or even this publican. Why? Because I fast twice a week and give tithes of all that I possess. Now, how many of you fast once a week? <laughs> Regularly. <laughs> Don't lift up your heart. I'm not asking for you to lift I just want you to compare yourself with the Pharisee and see the zeal. Some of us, we fast once a year. <laughs> or some of us have got very creative ways of fasting. <laughs> you fast between 8 and 12. <laughs> then you suspend the fast. You, re you resume at 2 to 6. <laughs> <laughs> and you fast for a whole week that way. <laughs> this guy used to fast twice a week. When it comes to tithing, Again, I know that tithing is a, a hill for many people. Imagine that money that you have been given by your parents. First of all, it is not enough, according to you. Mm -hmm. Or the one you get from the health or the university support. Then you are supposed to tithe from it. It is not easy. Mm -hmm. Now, the Jews used to tithe very zealously. In fact, the Bible says, if somebody had a sack of maize, they would pour it down. And then they count the grains. The every tenth one they put as a tithe. Every tenth one they put as a tithe. Every, so that by the end of the day they have got like 5 kgs out of 50 kgs. Of, that is how zealous they were. They were looking for righteousness. They wanted to obey God exactly to the law. Now Paul says, <laughs> I like your zeal. <laughs> I like 
some of you, you have to type. You just average the nearest 100. <laughs> you round it off. <laughs> you see, you just round it off the nearest 100. I mean, even if you have 10,000, you just say, Lord, uh, it's supposed to be 1,000, but let's just round it off about 800. It's enough. Mm -hmm. What they did not know is that their zeal was not valid because righteousness cannot be earned by good works. One has face out. The Bible says that the righteousness we have is from faith. It is in believing that God imputes righteousness on us. Mm. It is not something you earn. It is something that you receive by faith. Mm. So good works are good after salvation. But they don't, cannot earn you righteousness or salvation. That is what we call misguided zeal. You are putting your zeal on the wrong premise. The zeal cannot deliver for you righteousness. So that is zeal without knowledge. Another example about zeal without knowledge is the Apostle Paul before his conversion. Paul was a zealous man. He was very zealous for Judaism in the faith of his fathers. And he zealously pursued, arrested, and sought to kill Christians whom he thought were mistakenly corrupting the faith of his fathers. Paul was a Pharisee. He was uh, serving under one of the greatest scholars of his time, called by Gamaliel. And he was passionate about Judaism, and he was zealous. When these Christians showed up and began to talk about another guy who was crucified, um, a kind of a, you know, a criminal who was crucified, and now they say this is the, the Savior, is the Messiah, Paul would have none of it. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13 to 15. He describes his zeal. Thank you. So, what does Paul say? For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jewish religion above many equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly, I can't hear you read me, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, he continues and continues. Paul was zealous. He was zealous for his faith. He was zealous for the, the, the Jewish religion. Actually, Paul thought he was doing God a favor by persecuting Christians. He thought that he is defending the faith. But he says, continue verse 4, 15. So when he says, when God was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with the flesh and blood. Until he got a revelation of who Jesus was. Until he got to know who Jesus really is. That's when his eyes were opened. And he now became zealous. He continued to maintain the zeal, but he was now having zeal with knowledge. And Paul is one man who challenges me. In the book of Philippians, he writes in chapter 3, when he is, he is now in his old age, Paul says, I want to know him. I want to know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know him. And Paul is, has written almost two thirds of the New Testament. And he says, say, Brethren, I have not arrived. I have not reached. I do not see myself to have arrived. One thing I do, forsaking what is behind and straining to what is ahead, I press on. That is Z. Some of you, you have been saved for about 10 years. Isn't it? And you feel like uh, we are now the generals of the faith. Here, <laughs> 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 yeah, somebody giving a testimony that I got saved two years ago. Say, ah, you, you are still an infant in the life. <laughs> don't be talking where people are talking. You are not yet, you know. Mm -hmm. Paul was a giant of his own, but he said, I want to know him. I want to know Christ. I have not, I, I have not arrived. That is now zeal with knowledge. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so, I want to ask you some direct questions. Are you ready? Direct questions. One, what are you zealous for? 
Where is your passion directed at? What courses, objectives, and goals are you pursuing? What are you devoted to? What do you give your best thoughts and your best energies to? All those questions are just about one thing. Are we zealous for the right things? Do we have zeal with knowledge? Why do I say so? Because many people are passionate, but they are passionate about the wrong things. Some people are passionate about making money. There's a guy who used to have um, a bumper sticker. It was written, get rich or die trying. <laughs> <laughs> that was his passion, to be wealthy, to be rich. Some people's passions is about winning academic accolades. They want to say, I was number one in primary school, I was number one in secondary school, I did the first class degree, I got my master's when I was 17. Is that possible? Hi. <laughs> I got my PhD at age 25. Man, I became a professor at age 29. This is not a joke. <laughs> That's their passion, academic athletes. Some people are zealous about relationships. <laughs> Very zealous. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Yesterday you were talking about relationships. Mm -hmm. I was worried when Tim began to say, what did we learn yesterday? I knew that the first one on doing discipleship, people are going to give a few, a few responses. But should we have moved into relationships? <laughs> <laughs> Which is our personal spiritual work with God. We can be so busy serving God that we have no time for God. As a person, you have an inner life, that life of personal work with God, that devotional life. And then you have your life, which is evident to people, which people see as you serve, as you walk, as you live amongst people. That is what is your outer life. Now, there is a way in which, <clears throat> if we are not careful, we can spend a lot of time in our outer life and neglect our inner life. Because the outer life is what people see, <clears throat> isn't it? Mm -hmm. How you dress, <clears throat> how you talk, whether you come, go for meetings, you go for missions, you come for the prayer, that's what people see. But whether you prayed in the morning, no one knows. Mm -hmm. Whether you have fasted in the last one, two weeks, no one knows. Whether you had your own private devotion, where you are reading and studying a passage of scripture consistently in your own quiet time, no one knows. And as leaders, it is very, very possible that most of the things you do are to benefit others. And that is right, because that's what leaders do, isn't it? So when you pray, you pray for others. When you look at the scriptures, you are looking for a word to encourage God's people. Everything you do is about others, and you end up neglecting your own inner life. <clears throat> and so you may get to a place whereby your outward life is prospering, people are being blessed as they look at you, but inwardly, you yourself know that you are not strong, you are actually dying from within. Paul knew that this could happen, so he was writing to Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, as we still get our name, somebody can read for us. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. <clears throat> Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. He was praying for the Ephesian brethren. A prayer that I pray for you also. Oh, I can read. Yes. <clears throat> For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you 
with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with, the, with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God, is the love of Christ, and to know his love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Amen. He's saying, I pray that you may strengthen in your inner being. Did you see that one? Mm -hmm. So we, we, all of us as leaders, have an inner being. And it is possible for leaders to concentrate on their outer lives, to concentrate on their how people see you and how, where people expect you to be. So everything you do, you do so that others can still feel you are okay. But inwardly, inwardly, you are not growing. You are dying. You are drying. And so uh, we, we need to be, as we serve God with zeal, and we are, you know, everywhere and serving God and going out, we should not have an imbalance between our inner life and our outer life. Because our inner life of devotion is the foundation of our outer life of service. The Bible says, from the fullness of the heart. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. The mouth speaks. And that it flows from within. We only serve from the abundance of what is within us. Amen? Mm -hmm. So let me say this. Spiritual activity does not equal spiritual maturity. Can I say that again? Mm -hmm. Spiritual activity does not equal spiritual maturity. We must ensure that our inner lives is healthy as well. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? The other imbalance that knowledge helps us to cure is the imbalance between our academic life and ministry responsibilities for those who are students and for those who are working about our work and ministry responsibilities. See, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, there is time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. And so, in our zeal for God's work, we can easily neglect certain important aspects of our lives. For students, we can easily put our studies on the back burner. Why? Because we have so many responsibilities as students, as leaders, and so we find we don't have adequate time to balance and to be able to excel in all these things. So it is knowledge that helps you know, okay, I know you are zealous for the Lord, but don't let your academic suffer because of your ministry responsibilities. Are you able to balance them? Are you able to bite only what you can chew? You know, some of us, and it's just because of the zeal of the young people, we are in everything. <clears throat> I have given a testimony like this, some program we have had. When I was in the campus, because of the zeal, I was everywhere. <clears throat> I, I am not saying this is to my shame. Don't copy it. It's, 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 it's an example to avoid. You know, there are two examples. <laughs> example to copy and example to avoid. This is to avoid. <clears throat> I did not have time in the evenings to go and study. I can count for the four years the, how many times I've been able to study at night. <laughs> they are not more than 15 times in four years. Because Monday evening was the CU prayer meeting. <laughs> Seven to nine. At nine, the library closes at ten. Tuesday evening, we used to have what's called, I was doing anthropology. So we have anthropology class fellowship. <laughs> and I was the chairman of the fellowship. <laughs> Wednesday was the CU Bible studies from 7 to 9. Thursday, I was in the leadership of the CU. We used to have the exec meetings. Exec is the executive meetings. Those meetings were everlasting meetings. We used to begin at 8 and we end up at 4 the following day. And we used to feel that we are, you know, we are. We used to console ourselves. Brethren, we are the people who serve the Lord. When others are snoring, as we are in the affairs of the Lord. <laughs> Friday was our CU main fellowship. 
7.45 to 10. Saturday, we have the worship committee meeting. I was the chairman of the worship committee. 8 to around midday. Sunday, exec prayers. 7 to 9. Brethren, isn't it a miracle that I passed? I, this is not an example to copy. God is gracious. When you hear the Bible says that he makes race rain to fall both on the righteous and the unrighteous, believe it. <laughs> because I still graduated the top of my class. Wow. It's true. And got a direct scholarship for masters. But don't copy. <laughs> because you are supposed to have some time to study. Because God brought you to the university not just to serve, but also to grow and learn in your academics. So you need to be able to balance yourself. Pick up what you can chew. Make sure that your studies are not interfered with because you are everywhere. In the 1990s, some people went to the university but they left. The Z. They say, how can I be doing mathematics when the souls are perishing outside there? <laughs> this, is, this is wasting the Lord's time and energy. But here, they are doing the coefficients, the uh, permutations, the algorithms, is it algorithms or logarithms? <laughs> How will this one take somebody to heaven? <laughs> no. So I know some people who dropped out of the university and went to start churches because the souls were rich. I know some people who it is exams on Monday, but on the weekend if there's a mission, they're saying, uh, the Lord will sort us out. Let's go and harvest souls for the Lord. <laughs> so on Sunday, Monday morning, you have just come from a mission straight to the exam room. You're saying, the Lord, you understand. You know where we were with you. <laughs> Lord, you know where we were with you. And you cannot embarrass your servant like this. So just do what you need to do to make sure that I pass. Otherwise, it is your name. Lord. You will know that I, 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 I move it. It is your name that is honored among the bangers. Whatever you want to do, Lord, do it. Remind me. Or even a letter is marking. Mm. Where is it supposed to be an X, Lord? Just move his, his arm. He's <laughs> giving a day. Now, I always tell my students, God is a miracle work, mm. but he's not a magician. Mm. There's a difference between the two. <laughs> Don't ask God to perform magic. He will not. So, zeal must be tempered with knowledge. Otherwise, you become a person who is imbalanced and some things in your life will suffer. So as you serve God, you need to be able to trust God for that balance where you are committed to your work, your leadership responsibilities, but also you don't let your academics and the other aspects of your life suffer. When we the university, I had no time for social life. At the people, at the year that you are going to the field as a brother, Eh? How can you be going? How, how many people have you brought the Lord this week? So that you, so that you can waste the Lord's time that you are chasing a piece of inflated <laughs> This is not right. Eh? This is not right. So we did go for sports. We did go for to do bash. To do no, no, no. As we are in the house of the Lord, one thing I have desired you know that, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold His beauty and to inquire from His holy temple. We were just dwelling in the house of the Lord. <laughs> now, don't copy that. You need to leave the whole of life. Go for retreats. Go for academic trips. If you are gifted in sports, do some sports. You yes. never know. The Lord may use you to touch people in those other spheres also. Yes. And I see here an amen. 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 So this knowledge is what helps you to temper that zeal so that you can serve God with understanding. Amen? amen. But the other thing in terms of uh, the, the knowledge directing our priorities is that it helps us to 
get the balance between church involvement and CU involvement. Church involvement and CU involvement. I come from the school of thought that when you're a student, the CU needs to be your primary fellowship. For the four or five years in campus, I believe you need to serve God amongst your peers. One as a fear, son. It is so critical that you use that opportunity to serve God in the CU with people of like minded, as Tim was telling us. People of your generation, serving God with people of your generation. Now, some young people prefer to go to church house and campus. And uh, I'm sure there are good reasons for doing that. But for me, every young person I find, I tell them, serve God these four years. Be dedicated to the fellowship in the campus. And I have a good reason. The reason is this. The church will always be there. I can almost prophesy. You'll get married in the church, and you'll get buried by the church. <laughs> it's true. But the CU is just those four years. Four to five years. And there are things that you learn in the CU that you cannot learn in the church. And I hear them in there. And so, serving God together with the people in the generation is very important. There are things you learn about God, about His people, about ministry when you serve in the CU context that you may not learn outside. See, in the CU, for example, you get opportunities to lead that you may not get in the church. In the church now, for example, where Pastor Pete, Pastor Ponga serves, you cannot be a pastor if you have not gone through theological training. But in the CU, hey, even if you preach as someone offside, brethren just encourage you. <laughs> I've heard some brethren preaching in the CU, and they are not interpreting it correctly. You know, Paul Tim knows about something called hermeneutics, the science of preaching. No, uh, you know, the science of interpreting the scriptures. There's a, but in the CU, you can take an angle. Brethren are just blessed. Because they are also, they don't know that you are preaching wrong. They are just blessed. They just see your zeal and say, the Lord must be using that. <laughs> but in, in the church, there are people with PhDs in theology. When you begin preaching, they remove the spectacles, they put it like this. You go up. They look at you. This young man. May God have mercy on him. <laughs> so you have opportunity to serve God. I remember we went for missions. I went for, we went for missions many places. We went for missions in Taita Taveta. And uh, where this guy comes from? It's a man from Taita. And I was the one preaching in the final crusade. That day I didn't even take breakfast. How? <laughs> <laughs> I need a lot to pour an amount of anointing that like you never anointed me before. No, this is the grand finale. If you ever do anything, it is today. Because today we are living. I mobilized a number of people. When, as I was preaching on top of the podium, they were under the podium here. They were now, they were up holding me literally, literally in the spirit, and, and also, you know, I needed, the Lord needed to move in that place. So I preached. I preached my heart out. When I called the altar call, there is no one who came. Then I said, Where are the children? I called all the children. Do you want to receive Christ? I, I needed to have some harvest. <laughs> I prayed for the children. I prophesied over them. Some of you will be president. Some of you will be bishops. I prayed over them. You know the children all got saved. You know how children get saved 50 times. Every time the preachers, they lift up their hands. Mm -hmm. I still remember up to me, that mission. We went to Igoji in Merula. It was raining. Brethren don't care about the rain. In the rain, in the rain, in the rain. Now, the people are coming to see us. We are now a, a spectacle. People are being rained on and they are, you know young people? Because of that, they came to hear the gospel. That's how, so you learn in missions. You learn how to pray. I told you about the Zee prayer meeting. <laughs> There's this story about uh, Pastor John Wesley, the one who gave us this story, so I need to give him the credit. It's not my own story. It's this 
young person, a person who got saved. In those days, 70s, 80s, you get saved today, and the following day, there's a cash and a cash. They pass by to come and pick me, rather they're going to the cash. So this new believer went to the cash. So when he went to the cash, the person leading the prayer meeting said, Brethren, we have come here to pray. We have not come here to joke. If you want to joke, you are free to. No, we are not began to pray. So this guy said, Okay, I'm going to pray. He said, Oh God, we have come to pray. Thank you for my father. Thank you for my mother. Thank you for my brothers, my sisters. Thank you for the whole world in Jesus' name. One minute, his prayer is up. <laughs> Then he sheepishly opened his eyes <laughs> to find out, and there are some people who are still praying, and what are they praying? Yeah. When he opened his eyes, he saw the prayer warriors. They had not begun to pray. They were still setting the atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> so, they are doing like this. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I was brought up in the very Pentecostal people, the Shago people, where there was a clear distance. And if I learn this town people, the distance is usually very small. It's measured in millimeters. As was measured in meters squared. There was a great distance. So I was afraid of sisters. I said, hey, I'm Until my brother told, let's go and visit sisters. So I went. I was very careful. I discovered I can't backslide. By the end of the fourth years, I was taking a lot of Jewish and tea in sisters' houses. <laughs> and I was blessed. <laughs> you see, I, was, I, I grew in my social skills and how to relate with people and how to serve God with other people. Amen? <laughs> Let me tell you, young people, don't be in a hurry to go to the church out there. The church is always going to be. Besides, some of the things you have learned in the seal are the things you will go to bless the church with. Mm -hmm. Those leadership that you have been, that will bless the church. The, the, the gifts that you may have, you know, uh, worked on, the opportunities to serve God, these are things that will leave you unchanged. I always tell people that I grew the boost in my, if I was to plot my spiritual trajectory, I think the steepest part of the curve mm -hmm. is when I was in the seal. I served God from, from an usher to being a Bible study leader to a committee. We went from door to door. We went for urban evangelism, rural evangelism. We did everything, children's ministry. Nowadays, I don't have that, the, 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 the privilege and the leisure to do that. We went for cashers. Every Friday, we are there. We used to tell people, just come to pray in the house of the Lord. It is, don't be in the room. Even if you're coming to sleep, just come. It is better to sleep in the house of the Lord than to sleep elsewhere. <laughs> That's the zeal. <clears throat> so I want to encourage you. Don't be afraid. Serve God with your people and be involved in the zeal in the campus. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so we said, we are talking about how zeal is important in two ways. Number one, we said it helps to direct our zeal to the right course for purposes. Number two, we say it helps to determine our priorities. And lastly, the zeal the knowledge helps us to appreciate our limitations. It helps us to appreciate our limitations. <coughs> when we are young, <coughs> we usually feel that we are omnipotent. <coughs> that we can do everything at the same time. <coughs> Isn't it? And I know we have a verse that we quote, Philippians 4 13. I can do all things through Christ. But is it true that you can do all things? The answer is no. We are finite or finite people. We can only do so much, given the time and the opportunities. God gives us. We are, we have limitations. One as a Amen. And if we are not clear and are not aware, we can take up so much 
that our health or our relationships suffer because of overextending ourselves. One person, person has said this. He said there are two things that you should know in life. Number one, that there is a God who rules this universe. And secondly, that you are not the one. <laughs> Only God is omnipotent. <clears throat> so as we serve God, we need to appreciate that we cannot do everything. <clears throat> that we do not possess all the gifts and that we do not know everything. This calls for an approach to ministry that is sustainable. <clears throat> which means we need to embrace teamwork. One as if you are son. And embrace delegation. Allowing others, partnering with others, working with others to do God's work. A number of us believe that we are the only ones who can do it. So if you are in the present worship team, you believe if I am not there, the Spirit of God will not come down. It is when I hold the mic that the Lord feels that yes, there is somebody here I can work with. No! God can use other people. One has a few sons. Amen. <laughs> Some people die with the work. They don't delegate. I always make fun of the CU chairman in the campus. Some, when I go to speak there, you know, the C, some CU chairmen are very, they hold that title dearly. They don't want anybody to, you know. So they are the ones who are inviting the speaker every day, making, I told them, why must you do that? The vice chairman usually has no type of work. In the constitution written, in the absence of the team chairman, <laughs> shall do this. Now what about in the omnipresence of the team chairman? <laughs> what does the chairman, vice chairman do? That's why I told them, sometimes the vice chairman prays that something happens at home, at least when they, when they are told that he can get a chance also to invite the speaker. <laughs> Delegation. One has this <laughs> Teamwork. You are not, you cannot do everything. Don't overstretch yourself. You need to be able to find people that you can work with. So if you are gifted in singing, find some other people. Train with them. Give them a chance to sing. Maybe one song, two songs. Someday when you are not there, they will be able to. Now it depends with, it depends with. One of the prayers I ask God is help me keep the passion for God mm -hmm. and the passion for his word and the passion for his, for his ministry. Never be lacking in zeal. Some of you, God is going to lift you up after you finish campus and go into the world of work. God is going to lift you up to rise to higher echelons of corporate and organizational you know, hierarchies. Will you still keep the fire? If somebody from VOH who knew you now, 15 years come to your office and says, Praise the Lord, Sister Jane, what does he feel? What will you say? We're in the boardroom. Boardroom. The Z. Never be. God has called us to know him more to serve him with our own. Are we committed to him or are we serving only when it is convenient? May we give him our best. Amen? Amen. But two, it is not good to have zeal without knowledge. Is your zeal based on correct knowledge or is it blind zeal? May the Lord help us to have zeal that is informed so that we can serve God sustainably. Serving God sustainably means you don't begin with a dash. There are people who begin with a dash. You know, like the people who are uh, the marathoners. They set us. But after 200 meters, you don't see them. Forever. <laughs> now you are here. When you are 50, we want to see you again. Are you still you know, vibrant and vigorous and eager to serve the Lord, even then. That time now you have three or four kids. You are kids with the university at that time. 
They are the ones now in BOH. How about you? Will you still be there when you are saying, ah, during our days, mm. <laughs> eh, those days, I mean, you people are just jokers. As we serve the Lord, you, you are just, uh, you know, pretending. We, you need to know that we serve God. No. If you're going to serve God sustainably, you must combine zeal with knowledge. Otherwise, the zeal will fade. And the zeal will shrink. And before long, you'll be out of the race. And you finish, but you finish as somebody who is just... Have you seen that people who finish and they just fall down? I like the people who finish like Bekele. Kenanisa Bekele. He finishes 5,000 and still he goes one more round in the stadium. Just to tell the people, I could even do 10,000. Why are people not there? <laughs> no. And it is the knowledge that will help us to live, to run the race in a sustainable way. My prayer for you as young people and my, a lot of my ministry is the young people for the last 15 years or so. I, I don't speak at the churches often, but I speak to young people a lot, a lot, a lot. And I am excited about this because I know the future of the church is you people. The future of the Christian faith is in your hands. And so I want to come alongside you guys and support you and build you and facilitate you and make sure that you catch it so that when our time comes and we step out of the sea, there are people who God has prepared to take the gospel forward. And it is you, and you, and you. May the Lord help us as we continue to serve him and to grow, serving with zeal, not with half-hearted devotion. Amen? Amen. Amen.